Here we are as clergy of the Susquehanna Annual Conference to affirm and appreciate our connectional covenant so that we can lead our connectional church to be more faithful and fruitful for the sake of fulfilling the mission of our church to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. One of the first things you learn about the United Methodist Church is that it is a connectional church. Connectionalism is an essential part of who we are as a denomination. There is no other way around it. The Book of Discipline includes these words on a connectional church. Paragraph 131, the journey of a connectional people. Connectionalism in the United Methodist tradition is multi-level, global in scope, and local in thrust. Our connectionalism is not merely a linking of one charge conference to another. It is rather a vital web of interactive relationships. We are connected by sharing a common tradition of faith, including our doctrinal standards and general rules, by sharing together a constitutional polity, including a leadership of general superintendency, by sharing a common mission, which we seek to carry out by working together in and through conferences that reflect the inclusive, and missional character of our fellowship by sharing a common ethos that characterizes our distinctive way of doing things. Then in paragraph 701.1, we read, connectionalism is an important part of our identity as United Methodists. It is a vital web of interactive relationships that includes the agencies of the church with the purpose of equipping local churches for ministry and by providing a connection for ministry throughout the world, all to the glory of God. It provides us with wonderful opportunities to carry out our mission in unity and strength. Dr. Russell Rich, a renowned church historian, wrote these words, I quote, connectionalism constitutes one of the fundamentals of Methodism, a tradition since Wesley, a central feature of our practice, an essential in our identity, end quote. As a bishop of the church, upholding connectionalism is an essential part of my role and responsibility. Let me tell you a story. A farmer was watching the clouds one day when he noticed two clouds form a perfect letter P and a perfect letter C. He thought that meant he was to preach Christ. So he gave up farming and became a preacher. As a preacher, he was a complete failure. After two years, he had nobody in his church. So he went to the bishop and see what he was doing wrong. After prayer, the bishop told him he didn't think the PC meant preach Christ, it meant plant corn. <laughs> to this bishop, PC means preach connection, promote connection, and practice connection. First and foremost, the bishop is an elder of the church, a clergy member of the United Methodist Church, all elders and all clergy members of the United Methodist Church share the same responsibility for preaching connectionalism, promoting our connectional church, and practicing connection. As a connectional church, all the churches of our Susquehanna Annual Conference are interconnected, interdependent, and interwoven in a way that no one pastor is alone and no one church is alone. We are bound with one another by a common covenant. We are accountable to each other. We have the same mission statement, and we all share the same destiny. We know that being a connectional church is a tremendous challenge for such a time as this. It looks like connectionalism is contrary to what our culture values. 
for so many people, connectionalism is a foreign concept for being a church. Some people may resist it, and some people may even resent it. As a matter of fact, many people in the pews of our churches, even some of our leaders, clergy and laity alike, have little understanding of it, lack of commitment to it, and sometimes behave as if they were not part of it. We cannot assume that our people fully accept, affirm, and appreciate our church as a connectional church. I'm glad that we are gathered today, today to learn about leadership in a connectional context. As a clergy of a connectional church, we are to lead our people to live within a connectional covenant. In a building of stronger future for our church, a critical question we have to answer is, is a connectional church a burden and liability? Why is it an asset and a blessing? Does our church become stronger because of our connection? Or does it become weaker because of it? However, the truth is that we do not have any other option except to make it work as an asset and blessing to our church. As you may know, our Constitution has restrictive rules, which include that general conference shall not change or alter any part or rule of our government so as to do away, to do away with episcopacy, what destroy the plan of our itinerant general superintendency. We cannot do away with a connectional church. You and I are bound together. We are bound together. Some time ago, one of my colleagues shared with me this delightful piece titled, Top 10 Things Learned from Noah's Ark. Everything I needed to know, I learned from Noah's Ark. First, don't miss the boat. Two, plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Three, stay fit. When you are 600 years old, someone may ask you to do something really big. <laughs> Four, don't listen to critics. Just get on with the job that needs to be done. Five, Build your future on higher ground. Six, for safety's sake, travel in pairs. Seven, speed isn't always an advantage. The snails went on board with the cheetahs. Eight, when you're stressed, float a little. Nine, remember, the ark was built by amateurs, the Titanic by professionals. <laughs> Ten, Remember that we are all in the same boat. Once again, we are bound together. We are all in the same boat. As your Episcopal leader, it is my duty to do my best to make Connection of Church work, to make our connection a blessing and an asset to the mission and ministry of our church. Knowing that the destiny of the United Methodist Church hinges on its identity as a connectional church, I can't do ministry any other way. As a leader, your role and responsibility is to do your best to make a connectional church work, to make our connection a blessing and an asset to the mission and ministry of our church. No one has the perfect answer for this. But the thing is that together, we can always find a better way. We are on the journey together. I would like to suggest two things to you, leaders serving in a connectional context for making connectionalism work for our church. First, we've got to find a way to connect connectionalism to the mission of the church. We do not uphold a connection of church for the sake of promoting the institutional interests or for enhancing personal gains and entitlements. We believe in a connection of church because it is the best way to be a church that is more faithful and fruitful for fulfilling the mission of the church of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Church does not have a mission. Church 
is mission. We are a church in mission. We've got to find ways of telling exciting stories that our connectional church makes the mission of the church stronger, larger, and more significant, and fulfills the mission in more effective and rewarding ways. More life-changing and community-redeeming and world-transforming mission and ministry is possible and is accomplished because we are a connectional church. Second, we've got to find a way to connect connectionalism with covenant. As long as there is a firm commitment to the connectional covenant, our connectional church has a better chance to thrive. A covenant is an agreement with an oath. It is serious in nature because it requires a real commitment to honoring it. There are two essential elements that make a covenant worth making and keeping. One is a promise, and the other is an obligation. These two must be present to make a covenant worth honoring by all parties. Our challenge as leaders serving in a connectional context is how do we make the promise an exciting vision for a preferred future, and how do we make the obligation a firm commitment? No one has all the answers, but I would like to say that together we are on the journey. They can lead us to a better answer. We take this journey with a sense of joy and privilege as we put our hope and trust in the God who is with us on this journey. Thanks be to God, we are an Easter people. Good Friday shows what the world can do, but Easter shows what God can do. With a God who raised Jesus from the dead, hope lives on. So let me close with one of my favorite verses from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let it be so. Amen.